morning. I hope you're doing well today. Uh, about uh, uh, a little over a week ago, two weeks ago, maybe a week and a half ago, my son was in town and uh, we had a chance to get together on a morning and he said, Dad, you want to go for a run? And I'm sitting there thinking, do I want to go for a run? I mean, I was born to run. And so... <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm thinking, yeah, I'll go for a run. So we get out there. Well, he runs. Um, I died. It was like pathetic. Um, he's he's uh, clearly younger, and it's I've got all of the dad ego stuff going on. I mean, I taught this boy how to walk. I taught this boy how to run. Uh, I taught this boy athletics. I taught this boy agility, and he is just killing me. I mean, he's, and, and then it gets worse. He starts wanting to talk. <laughs> he, it's all I can do to keep going. I'm just sitting there thinking, right, left, right, left, right, left. Don't die in front of your son. And then it's talk. Okay, it's not just talk, but it's significant talk, like requires thinking. Questions like, do theologians believe that God spoke through prophets in that manner, in the manner of the Old Testament prophets, only in that day? Questions like, what's the reasoning for the views that these Old Testament prophets had special knowledge that God no longer dispenses today. Questions like, is the idea that there was a greater need for the knowledge then in the Old Testament times and with the Bible now, we don't need that kind of insight? Questions like, was the prophetic voice we read in the Old Testament the same idea or gift that the New Testament talks about as the gift of prophecy? These questions are relevant not just to Will and me as we're running and this class as we're studying, but if you talk to someone who, for example, is, is a Mormon, they will tell you that the foundation for their Mormon faith is the idea that the gift of prophecy in an Old Testament prophetic voice has continued through today. And so it gives them additional revelation they deem from God. So these are relevant questions, not just in the fields of, of our biblical understanding, but they're relevant as we try to relate to other people and other uh, faith traditions within our culture. So I'm just dying while we're running, and I can't handle all of this. But I will tell you this, that, that there is a difference between the biblical prophets of the Old Testament and the prophets of the world that existed at the same time. And what I want to do as we talk about Nahum today is I want us to really hone in on what is significant about biblical prophets. Because I think you'll find it very different, not only culturally and contextually within history, Israel was very different in the way that the God and God communication took place then from all the cultures around them Israel sticks out like a sore thumb Israel did not merely imitate those of surrounding cultures the prophetic voice in Israel was very very distinct it was unique in the world's prophets at the time, and, and you could go to the Assyrians, you could go to uh, uh, the other local tribal people, the, 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 the plain Syrians as opposed to the Assyrians. You could go to the Egyptians. You could go to all of the different cultural entities that existed at the time. And one thing they had in common, they had prophets who would proclaim divine inspiration. But here's the way the world's prophets did it. Those prophets controlled their gods 
in the, in the, not in the sense of making the gods do things, but more in the sense of, of, of getting knowledge from the gods, getting insight, getting a word from their gods. Some were just through magical incantations. They would do some magic, not, you know, nothing up my sleeve, presto, but, but they would do a magical incantation and the gods were required to answer. Magic bound the gods. Not only that, sometimes, the, especially the Assyrians, were really big on reading livers. They'd kill the animals because the livers held the secrets of the gods. And they could dissect the liver, and they could figure out what the message was from the gods. Astrology was big. They could read the stars and read the signs because the stars and the signs, those governed the gods as well. In a sense, they were the gods. And insight into those stars would be insight into divinity. That's very different from the biblical concept of a prophet of God. The Israelite concept is God exists and he's not bound by magic and he's not bound by the elements of the world and he cannot be simply discerned and determined by the presence of the stars or the makeup of a desiccated liver. God exists independently, autonomously, and God, when God chooses to speak, will speak through the prophets. Now the prophets may go and seek a word from the Lord, but the Lord was never obligated to give it. God was never at the beck and call of the prophets. The prophets were at the beck and call of God. You see the difference? It makes Israel stick out like a sore thumb when you can compare it to the other cultures because this is a question of control, but it's also a question of message. It's no longer simply who controls who. Does the prophet control God or does God control the prophet? But it's also a question of message. Is the message truly one that God wants delivered or is it one that the prophet is pulling forth? And so with those differences, we can look at that, the biblical understanding and see that it's very, 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 very different. Now, God, according to Deuteronomy 18, 15, raises up his prophets. They're not selected by the king. They're not inheriting their rights. A prophet, in Israel's understanding, was someone that God raised up. God says in Deuteronomy 18, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. The prophet is not simply musing about a situation. God has raised up the prophet. God has put God's words into the prophet. And the prophet speaks them. Kipi Adonai Diber, because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. When that prophet speaks, he speaks what God has commanded him. Jeremiah says that God chose him as a prophet before he was even in his mother's womb. So an Old Testament prophet is not simply someone who has some inherent ability to see the future. It's someone that God has deliberately chosen, created for that purpose, called them forth into that occupation, and put God's very words into their mouths to speak to the people. That's the understanding Paul had. Paul was talking about what benefit is it to be a Jew in Romans 3. He says, well, it's a huge benefit for starters to the Jews were entrusted, he says, quote, the very oracles of God. See, for Paul, the Old Testament, which was delivered by prophets, were the very oracles, the very words of God. 
The writer of Hebrews says the same thing in Hebrews 1. He says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. The prophets were God speaking to the people. Now, why do I pause and why do we go into this and what makes this worthy of extra attention? Well, I would suggest to you it's worthy of extra t attention because we have, you know, if, if you want to read your Bible, you start reading the Old Testament and you can read through it and you can find some wonderful, interesting, compelling stories. You'll find scripture that's, that will convict you, that will uh, uplift you, that will, will uh, uh, bring you before the very presence of God and speak to your life. But academically, when you start studying the Old Testament, you will find that there is a lot that makes it read differently than sometimes we just think. One of the youth ministers I had growing up, I was talking to him about what I wanted to do with my life. And one of my ideas was, I want to go to school, I want to get this and this degree, I want to ultimately get my PhD in Old Testament from Harvard. And my youth minister said to me, oh, don't do that. I said, why? He said, because if you go get that much education, you will lose your faith. And I walked away thinking, so my faith is for dummies? Don't get smart. Don't get too educated. You will lose your faith. Well, to an extent, what he had to say was a recognition of the fact that in a lot of academic circles, the Old Testament, and the New Testament for that matter, but the Old Testament is not really viewed as Paul viewed it as the oracles of God. It's viewed as a composite of the musings of man. And there are, in academic circles, big wars that go on, wars of words and ideas, over whether or not uh, uh, the, the first five books of the Old Testament, were they... Were they written as books of Moses? Were they written as, as different source materials that were subsequently put together from the priests, from the northern kingdom of Israel's traditions, from all of these different traditions? Some loop it into four, the Yahweh's tradition that uses Yahweh, the Elohim tradition, the Deuteronomic tradition, the priestly tradition, and, 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 and these seem to be put together. You can find passages in the scriptures where it looks like, you know, in Genesis, there's a reference that we've talked about in this class before, where during the time of, 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 if Moses is accorded writing Genesis or a good bit of it, there's, there's a reference to a town that didn't even exist then. And so scholars will point to these things and point to these ideas and, and they've manifested themselves over several hundred years of academia to where a lot of people will look at the Old Testament and say, well, it's, you know, you can't say that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were written by Moses. Not to mention the fact that they talk about him dying and what happened after he died. But you, you, you can't say that they were written by Moses. And then they'll go into Joshua and they'll go into Judges and say, this isn't reliable history. Then they'll go into First and Second Kings and say, this sure isn't reliable history, and compare it to First and Second Chronicles and say, see, they don't even compare outright. That's why this is worthy of extra attention. This is worthy of extra attention because the biblical teaching, and, and here's what I always want us to do. I want us to be careful to hold to the biblical teaching. And not just what we think it might be, but let's really try and see what Scripture claims. And the claim of Scripture 
is that God has spoken his word through his prophets. The claim of Scripture, the reason Scripture has authority, the reason the Old Testament has authority is not simply because Moses wrote every word of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's because those books, in the form in which we have them today, those books, at some point in time, and when I say the form in which we have them today, there's criticism over changing this word or that word. I'm setting that aside. I mean the idea of the five books of Moses, for example. Those went through the hands of the prophets of God. And, and, and the idea is, through Scripture, that the prophets have put their thumbprint on it. This is not where some random people edited together traditions. If traditions were in fact edited together, they were edited together by prophets who were raised up by God for that purpose, putting together the words of God. And so it's very important as we look at a passage like Nahum that we try to do the real determination, which is how would anybody determine if someone was an authentic prophet? Because clearly there were false ones. Scripture is Scripture because it has the imprimatur of the prophets of God. God worked through his prophets to place it there. And that's the way Paul understood it, and that's the way the writer of Hebrews understood it, that's the way the Lord understood it. So if, if this is what Scripture is, then we do that next step of saying, okay, well, how did they authenticate the prophets? How do we know that they knew who was a real prophet and who wasn't? Was it by looking? I'm voting the guy on the left. I think the guy on the right's a charlatan. But that's not the test. The test was never by looking. Deuteronomy sets it out. The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, this is God talking, that I have not commanded him to speak, that same prophet shall die. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that's a word the Lord didn't speak, and the prophet spoke it presumptuously. How do you authenticate a prophet? Did it come true? Were they accurate? Were they right? Did they speak the words of God? Which not only can be measured by events, but can be measured by other prophetic words as well. And so that's how one would know. Now, with that background, I want us to look at the prophet Nahum. I don't know that he really looked like this. I've never seen the guy. He died a few thousand years ago. Didn't leave a picture that I've been able to get. I looked on the internet for him. He didn't even have a Facebook page. So it was really <laughs> tough to find. So I just went with this guy. That guy looks kind of like Nahum in my mind. So with that guy being Nahum, let's talk about the book of Nahum. It's three short chapters. It's in the Old Testament. It's one of the 12 minor prophets. And as I've told you before, that doesn't mean that they were under the age of 18 when they wrote it. It just means that they're not considered the ones that have the larger girth of material. We've got to first put Nahum in his historical context to understand what he had to say. I've got to pause for a moment. And give kudos again, one reason this is a lot of fun right now for us is if you were here Sunday a week ago, Pastor Fleming said, hey, don't just read John 3.16, find one of those obscure Old Testament prophets you never spend any time with and read it. That's what we're doing today, Nahum. Put him into historical context on the timeline I'm putting up here, 640 to 609 B.C. That's the reign of the good king Josiah that we talked about last week as we're dealing with the fall of Judah. If you're new to the class, just sort of catch in and plug in as we're going along. Bottom line is Israel, the northern part of uh, the northern kingdom had fallen some time ago. The southern kingdom of Judah has gone through 55 years of Manasseh as an evil, wicked king with maybe a slight turn at the end of his life. 
And then his uh, son Ammon on the throne for two years, a wicked king, murdered in a coup d'etat. And the eight-year-old son Josiah taking the throne. And Josiah reigns from 640 to 609 when he dies at the age of 39 going out to fight Pharaoh as Pharaoh's going to help the Assyrians. So, Josiah, he's the king while Nahum is prophesying. The real ruler of the world is an Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal. And Ashurbanipal ruled from 668 to 627 or so. It's, the records get kind of fuzzy at the end on when he died. That's scholars' best estimate. The Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, is ruling the world from 668 to 627. Judah, at this time, Josiah, is paying an annual tax. Once a year, Josiah would be required under Assyrian law to go to the capital city of Nineveh. He would, Josiah would bring his retinue with him and he would bring his annual tax and he would pay it to Ashurbanipal, ruler of the world. Now, if we put a map up here, Assyria at this point in time, Assyria is kind of like, um, like Germany in that it doesn't have real easily definable borders. You know, the United States, we've got pretty definable borders. There's the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, save for some islands here and there, and Alaska that we bought from the Russians. But the main land of the United States has very definite borders. Now the border with Mexico is, can be fuzzy in places, not with Texas, it's just the Rio Grande River. The border with Canada, well you've got the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway for a good bit of it, but as you get into the Midwest and the West it gets a little fuzzier. But definable borders make for a very good clean country. Non-definable borders do not. And so you've got some country like Germany that can claim to be the fatherland and it's going to say that it's got the borders extend into Poland uh, according to Hitler. The borders extend over here, over here, over here. The same way with Assyria. Assyria didn't have really definable borders so they were always claiming everything. This is the Assyrian kingdom at the time and Ashurbanipal rules it when the Assyrian kingdom is at its largest. Now, Ashurbanipal, we know a good bit about this fella. He wasn't just some um, renegade, um, hillbilly king. This guy could have been from Lubbock. He was sophisticated. He was smart. He was extraordinarily fluent. He was multilingual. He could read all of the cuneiform scripts, not just in his current tongue. He could read Sumerian, he could read Akkadian, he could read Aramaic. The man was very fluent. In a time where most people were not literate, he was, even as he was king. We know that he was a great hunter. We know that he was a great military leader. He squashed rebellions like a bug. We know that he was strong in mathematics. He was a math whiz. He aced his SATs. He also built the world's greatest library to that point in history. His library had books on everything from astronomy and math. It had books on, it had dictionaries and lexicons where it compared words from different languages and, 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 and a massive library he created in Nineveh. Here's an interesting picture of him. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this gives you an idea of what kind of guy he was. That's him right uh, there. He's kind of laying back in the divan eating. He's doing it under this very fruitful uh, grapevine. See the grapevine up there with all the little grape clusters? Now, lower than him is his wife. She's sitting there with him, no doubt enraptured by his stories. 
He's telling her about his great military defeats and all of his prowess and probably doing some ciphering. That's math if you watch the Beverly Hillbillies. Probably doing some ciphering just to show her he can. The most amazing part of this relief to me is right over here in this pine tree. You can see all the pine branches, but there's something that looks kind of messy in the top right where I've put that arrow. That's the head of the Elamite king hanging upside down after it had been decapitated by Ashurbanipal. So he's just sitting over there regaling his queen with his stories of battle while he's got the king's head hanging upside down with all the flies buzzing around just a couple of trees away. This is King Ashurbanipal. King Ashurbanipal is ruling the world. He's the world's most powerful man maybe that had ever existed to that point in time. Into this historical context comes Nahum, and Nahum makes the following prophecy. Thus says Yahweh, though they, the Assyrians in Ashurbanipal, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Now I got to tell you, that is a bold prophecy. You can't just, oh, I have a gift of prophecy. I'm prophesying that the Houston Texans will play football today. Okay. No. Or, because I'm a lawyer, uh, here's an interesting one. Uh, there, there was an interesting legal situation. I've got to do this quick because I don't want to spend too much time on it. But this shows you how people can fuzz around and claim to be prophets. Here's what they did. They sent out a thousand letters that said, I mean a hundred thousand letters that said, this stock's going to go up in the next six weeks. Six weeks later, either the stock went up or it didn't. If the stock went up, oh, I messed the story up, and I'm in a hurry too, sorry. They sent out 100,000 letters, 50,000 said the stock goes up, 50,000 said it goes down. Okay, now you're with me. Six weeks later, if the stock went up, they just take the 50,000 they wrote that said it was going up, they ignore the other people. And they send them a letter saying, here's another stock. And in 25,000 of those letters, they say it's going to go up. And in 25,000, they say it's going to go down. A few weeks later, let's say it goes down. They take the 25,000. They've now called two stocks dead right on. And they send them a letter. And half of them, they say this third stock's going up. And the other half, it's going down. And then they follow through. And finally, they've got 6,000 people. And they've called four stocks dead right. And those 6,000 people don't know about anything else they've been doing. They're just saying, man, every time this guy sends me a letter, he gets it dead right. I'm giving him my money to invest. See, that's not valid prophecy. Anybody could do that. That's mathematics. Nahum makes an incredibly bold prediction, though. He makes one that's an outrageously bold prediction. Let me explain why. Josiah is reigning right then, and he's paying his tribute to Ashurbanipal, the most powerful king in the world. But you can go back before Josiah, before Ashurbanipal was Irshaddon from 681 to 669. He was the Assyrian king before. He was getting his payments from Israel. You go back before Irshaddon and you had Sennacherib. Sennacherib, 705 to 681, he's getting paid. Hezekiah tried to withhold tribute for a while, but that didn't work out real well. You can go back before Sennacherib. For over 200 years, Judah had been paying their tribute to the Assyrian overlords. The Assyrians had been the global superpower for over 300 years and had existed as a nation for over 1,500 years. And Nahum says, it's just a matter of time. Right around the corner, they're going to be cut down and they're going to pass away. That's a bold prediction. It's a very bold prediction. But the bold prediction came true. Assyria crumbled. And Assyria crumbled quickly. It still doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a scholar who's no longer alive. His name was Andre Perrault. He was a Frenchman. 
and he was the head of the, the Ecole, Ecole de Louvre. Um, he was uh, uh, headed up the Mari expeditions. This was his area. Here's what he says. It is hard to understand why the fall of Assyria was so complete and so rapid. Never had the empire seemed been so great or seemed so mighty. And indeed, it was mighty. For 125 years, it had been sustained by continuous endeavor with which which had never relaxed. For six generations, the throne had passed from father to son, so kings were assured of the permanence on which the power of their dynasty depends. They were able to survive crises, bring to a completion a remarkable achievement. What they achieved was, it is true, the enslavement of the world, affected by means and methods so savage and brutal as to defy description. The Assyrians were... There's no reason they should have fallen, but they did. Nahum prophesied it, and God saw to it. Now, if I were King Josiah, and I had the prophecy of Nahum, and I saw him prophesy that Assyria would fall, and I'm seeing Assyria falling, I'd be really wanting to know something. Why? Why did God destroy Assyria? Well, it's interesting, when you read Nahum, Nahum starts out, and Nahum makes it clear, God is slow to anger, but Nahum 1 verse 2 says, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adver adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Yes, God is slow to anger. Remember, it was Nineveh and Assyria where Jonah had been sent to preach deliverance. Jonah's the one who wanted to see the empire crumble. Jonah's the one who wanted it to fall apart. Jonah's the one who said, it's such a horrible, wicked, bloody, terrible place. I don't want to go preach repentance there because what if they turn around and repent? You being you, God, will forgive them. I'd rather you wipe them out. You would expect Jonah to have written Nahum when you read the the, the, the venom in Nahum. But God is a jealous and avenging God. He's avenging and wrathful. Now that's not for people who are in his care. For them he is a stronghold. And he protects. But he does not countenance evil. Because it's destructive and it's wrong. And it's contrary to his character. And it's contrary to his creation. And it's contrary to his plan. And it is his intent and will ultimately be his goal to destroy it. So why did God destroy Assyria? Well, according to Nahum, Nineveh, which is Assyria's capital, these are the walls at this point as they've been reconstructed somewhat. Nineveh um, is the capital. It represents all that Assyria is. It's a bloody city. It was built on the blood of many. It's full of lies. It's full of plunder taken by force from others, i.e. stolen. Brutally stolen. And so Nineveh is, a, uh, is something that God was going to destroy as he destroyed the Assyrians. The destruction is talked about in... Uh, Nahum chapter 2 and 3. Look at some of the language that, that Nahum uses here. I mean, he's, he's pretty specific on this bold prophecy. In talking about the destruction of Nineveh in chapter 2, he says, The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. This is the opposing army that's coming in. Are the shields red because they've got blood on them? Or did they paint them red to make it look like they were such savage warriors that they'd killed a bunch of people and the blood was on them? Same with the clothes. Do the clothes have red clothes? We don't know. Several armies are involved in the conquering of Nineveh. Not just the Babylonians. His soldiers are clothed in scarlets. The chariots come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. 
The cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets, rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches, dart like lightning. The light, the sun is flashing off the metal on the chariots as they're rushing back and forth, back and forth, and the spears are being shouted, uh, 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 brandished. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. The river gates are opened. The palace melts away. Keeps going. Desolation. Desolation and ruin. Hearts melt. Knees tremble. All of this. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke. The sword will devour your young lions. The lions were the symbols of the nobility. I will cut off your prey from the, vo the earth. The voice of your messenger shall no longer be heard. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey. Cra the crack of the whip, rumble of the wheel, galloping horse, bounding chariot. Horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear. Hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. Pretty bold language. Pretty bold language. And, and that's the destruction. That at the height of power for Assyria, Nahum is prophesying. Now, here's an interesting tidbit. If we were doing this class 200 years ago, we couldn't really do it this way. Because as of 1845, there was not one archaeological artifact from Nineveh there was not one archaeological artifact that seemed to have been Assyrian. All of the discoveries that really propelled our understanding of this happened in, starting in the, 19, in the 1840s, in the mid-1840s especially. This is what the land looked like if you were there in the 1840s. Pardon that line, that was a crease in the middle of the page. This picture was on two pages and I scanned it in. I couldn't fix the crease. But that's when Austin Henry Layard, a British fella, in his late 20s, goes over and decides he's going to start finding out whether or not there's any evidence of the Assyrian Empire. Because there's none. There's a reference in 626 AD in some written thing to Nineveh, but that's it, other than the Bible. And he goes out, and it's a real compelling story. There's a number of places you can read about it, but he starts digging in one of these hills, and he uncovers Nineveh. And he just finds it. Nineveh, this is the Tigris River there on the bottom left of this picture. Uh, the Koza River goes right through it. The, the drawings that you see here, those are the city walls. Nineveh was built at the convergence of the Koza River, a tributary that went into the Tigris. And the way Nineveh was built, it actually was built on both sides of the Koza River. So it had gates. Because that river flowed through it for protection, there were still gates that went right up to the river so that people couldn't invade. Also, you had trouble because of flooding. So what the kings did, I think it was Sennacherib was the king who went north about 13 kilometers and built floodgates for the, the, the river so that they could regulate the water coming in. These are the gates that Nahum says will be busted open. This city was conquered. Um, in, in 1923, they translated the text. Oh, by the way, when they discovered Nineveh, Nineveh had been sacked and burned, and it was the burning of Nineveh that caused those clay tablets in Ashurbanipal's library to become hard. It fired the clay. So his library survived. So we got 28,000 some odd library books, not to mention the overdue cards. From Ashurbanipal's library, and there's translate. They, they, you didn't have anybody who could read this stuff in 1847 when Layard first discovered it, but by 1957, Assyrian is a language that a number of scholars read. You now have a whole new scholastic discipline of Assyriology. They knew nothing of Assyria outside of the Bible, although the Bible does get every name right. Archaeology has shown the Bible to be dead on accurate with this stuff, as we've already seen before. But here's, here's the account of the sacking of Nineveh. 
um, translated in uh, uh, 1923. Let's see if we can get this to show on here. Um, from the month of Simenu to the month of Abu, three times they battled. Abu is uh, August, is our rough equivalent here. A mighty assault he made upon the city. This is Nabopolassar, the, the, the Babylonian king who's fighting. In the month of Abu, the X day, the city was taken. A great slaughter was made of the peoples and nobles. On that day, Sin Sharishkun, who was king of Assyria, that was the son of Ashurbanipal, fled from the city. Great quantities of spoil from the city, beyond counting, they carried off. The city they turned into a mound and ruin heap. The army of Assyria deserted, literally ran away before the king of the king of Akkad. Akkad is, is Babylon in this sense. And it happened in 612 B.C., in August of 612 B.C. Assyria is conquered. Nineveh is destroyed. There's a remnant of Assyrians that stick around for three years. But it's gone. The words of Nahum became, uh, they, they, they were authenticated as valid words of a valid prophet. Needless to say, they made the Hebrew canon. It's interesting to look at the last chapter of Nahum, chapter 3. Nahum is not without irony and sarcasm in the way he prophetically delivered it. He starts out this, prophecy, uh, this chapter, last chapter with, Woe to the bloody city. The Hebrew word there is hoy. The Yiddish today is oy. Hoy means ah. Woe. What a pity. This is the way laments started. Oh, so tragic. But he's being very ironic because he ends it with, now let's break out in applause that God has done this and destroyed that city. All who hear the news about you, clap their hands. Hey! So he starts out with, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> That's why I figured Jonah would have really liked that book. That was the attitude Jonah wanted. So he starts out with, oi, and then he says, now let's clap our hands in applause. Now, what does this do to my questions with Will? Do theologians believe that God spoke through prophets in that manner, only in that day? Well, there are so many theologians, you can get so many different points of view on that, and I'm not answering that question today. Sorry, you'll have to come back. But I will tell you this. Without getting into those questions, the reason Hebrew authority is there for Hebrew scriptures is because they were confirmed by valid prophets who spoke the word of God. Now, some people may look at Nahum and say, well, it's just so accurate, maybe he wrote it afterwards. But that's a stretch. That's a hard stretch because of what's internal within Nahum. It truly fits within that time frame and has bookends that show how early it would be and how late it would be. But I mean, it's, it's confirmed. It's the Word of God. So where does that leave us? What are the points we can glean from Nahum today? An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. Lots of folks don't even know where Elkosh is. Some scholars think that it's in, in Galilee. Some scholars think Elkosh is not really a town that they've been able to locate in, in Nahum's time. So it's more a reference to what that Hebrew means. Elkosh in Hebrew can mean God is harsh. Is God harsh? Is God harsh? He can be. God does not countenance evil. Evil destroys. Evil breaks in like a thief in the night, as the father of evil does. And evil in your life and evil in my life is not bearing good fruit. And God doesn't like it. When Paul says, let your love be genuine, he says, hate what is evil, in the very next clause. Because genuine love hates evil, because evil is destructive. Is God harsh? He's harsh to evil. But to his children? He's so loving that he would send his son 
to bear all manner of harshness. And give us the assurance that Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? You know, he raised up Assyria. He used Assyria to judge Israel. He used Assyria to judge his people time after time after time. But when he was done with Assyria, those scholars don't understand how. In a matter of decades, he rolled them up and threw them out. And they have been gone ever since. If that God is for you and for me and for what's best for us, who can be against us? Come what may, let the wind blow. I'm standing on the rock. And if it knocks me down, then I'll be laying on the rock. But I'm on the rock. And the rock has me firm. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength in many, they will be cut down and pass away. Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you that in me, Jesus, you might have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Oh, God raises up empires and he lets them go. The Assyrians had been around over 1,500 years. How long has America been a country? 230 So six times the history of America and God rolls them up almost overnight. Your tribulations, my tribulations, all of the struggles, everything we face, God's looking to purify us. He's looking to get rid of evil. He's looking to bring his people forth. But he does it in a way of overcoming tribulation and overcoming the world. So we're of good cheer. Last. Nineveh. When Nahum is challenging Nineveh in Nahum 3.8, he says, Oh, you're thinking we can't fall. We're a capital city. We've got water. We've got all of this. Are you any better than Thebes? Because Thebes was defeated by the Assyrians in 668, I think, B.C. Thebes was the capital of Egypt. It's on the Nile. It's supposed to be unbeatable because it's got the Nile for water. It's got walls. It's got everything it needs. Who could defeat Thebes? So Thebes thought until the Assyrians beat him. So Nahum saying, Nineveh, you don't think this applies to you? You think you're better than this? Are you any better than Thebes? Remember that? The problem with Nineveh was they were arrogant. They were haughty. They were prideful in addition to all of their evil. And if we know anything, it's that God opposes the proud. I like the way James says it in the New Testament. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So that's my third takeaway. Now, I love my Old Testament. The oracles of God, the words of God, written by prophets, put together by prophets, attested to by the prophetic, understood that way by Paul, and applicable for us today. So in humility, I pray that we will seek to serve our Lord, trusting him in the midst of whatever Assyrian giant we face. You want more? Read Habakkuk, short book. Habakkuk, uh, the, the, the rhyme we learned to help us remember it in, in school was Habakkuk talked back it because um, he talks back to God some. It's an interesting read. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask that you bless our studies. I ask that you bless everyone who's listening to this message that by taking this message, Lord, may your spirit convict them that you are the God over nations and that you are the God over history, that nobody exists that you haven't brought forth into existence. That everybody who hears this message, Lord, may they just anew be convicted that you know their name and you have reached out your hand to touch their lives. And if they take shelter in you, Lord, you are a stronghold that will never betray any of us. Stronger than all the evil, all the empires, and all the history that can muster by the, by the enemy. So, Lord, we stand before you in humility of Jesus, 
asking for your guidance and your protection and your wisdom in our walk as we seek to serve you each day. Through Jesus we pray, amen.